This is the Blaring Out with Eric Blair Show, and today I'm pleased to have the man, the myth, the legend, German drum virtuoso, composer, and multi-instrumentalist, Marco Miniman. How you doing today, Mark? Where? I'm good. How are you, man? <laughs> Thanks for taking the time. Marco, what was your youth like growing up in Hanover, Germany? Cool. You know that I grew up in Hanover. Bonus points. Um... Well, you know, it was pretty cool. I mean, we're from the north. It's a, it's northern Germany. We're kind of, you know, very different, you know, than the south. We we always make fun of the people, you know, like like London would do of Scotland or something. But at the end of the day, we kind of drink beer together and love each other. And Hanover, uh, especially, is kind of, you know, an exhibition city. We have like the Messe, we call it. The Hannover Messe is like very, very famous, you know, for yeah, like introducing new technology and all this kind of stuff. So that was my upbringing in that sort of boring but dedicated city. What was your use like? My parents are awesome people. They introduced me uh, at an early age to really good music, you know, like I was listening a lot of Jethro Tull, Queen, Led Zeppelin, The Police. Uh, later on Frank Zappa they took me to all the shows I saw Queen with Freddie Mercury twice you know how cool is that you know I thought and uh, so they were always very supportive so I had like you know a very musical upbringing with them how did you become proficient on both guitar and drums by age 11 well I started actually strangely enough with organ like two manual organ you know and then foot bass so because I was always fond of rock music by that time and I was air drumming and playing air guitar or tennis record or something and then I got sticks at some point and was you know banging on you know cushions and pillows and whatnot and uh for some reason my father he said like hey you know what i'll buy you a drum set but i would like you to have harmonic knowledge so how about like learning piano or organ to get like you know that whole thing and uh i thank him for that you know obviously because it helps me writing songs you know because that's what i always wanted to do so um but then later on when i kind of picked up guitar and drums pretty much at the same time it was just like I was just driven, I guess, that's the right word, driven. I wanted to know it. Nobody had to force me to take lessons or kind of to ex explore. I just wanted to kind of get the most knowledge out of the instruments and can, uh, instruments, and then kind of speak freely and articulate myself with it. So that was always, you know, basically a calling, you know, for me. Uh, I did this not really just because I had a choice to do this. It was like literally a calling. It was like ultimate passion. How would you measure your confidence level when you joined the band Freaky Funkin' Weirdos in Munich, Germany at 19. I was a youngster, you know, and I was kind of sheltered living at home still. And all of a sudden I was kind of, you know, getting out on the road with this band, you know, and uh, pretty rowdy band as well, you know, they were older than I was, you know, so I experienced the whole sex, drugs and rock and roll thing at full force and moved to a different city and was all of a sudden living in rehearsal spaces then kind of upgrading to like rooms you know because I could afford it when we sold albums but then touring you know and just uh, it was it was a trip man but I think it's necessary to kind of you know grow up and, and get streetwise well then how did you not become a casualty of sex drugs and rock and roll then well I am here I am look at me man <laughs> I'm even trying to wear the I love your shirt to make it better but there are all these girls and all those drugs now. Okay, just kidding. I was never really into drugs so much, you know, like that stuff I saw, like, you know, what it did to people. So I was never really, I never smoked. I never did any of any powders or substances or whatnot. I enjoy a good beer and my shirt. <laughs> and would you say that your music is your high? Well, yeah, it completely teleports you into areas, you know, where, you know, usually only dreams take you to. That's what I always kind of think. It's like uh, it's, music is the safest place on earth. You know, when you're in the zone, nothing else matters. You know, your mail at home or whatever, or where do you have to drive next or whatnot. It's like an ultimate bond with you and the audience. Or if you're just, you know, writing music, it's just the ultimate, how do you say, like, it's almost like therapeutic. It's, uh, it's just like, you know, this zone that you're entering, which is... Uh, kind of the subconscious door opens it's fun it's fantastic love it how did you go from the weirdos recording a cover version of ian dury's song hit me with your rhythm stick with nina hagen to being on tour with nina hagen good question uh nina is like a used to be like a big star in germany you know and uh and she wanted to co uh, collaborate with us and uh we picked like that song i don't even know why we picked that song you know for some reason it kind of popped up and um yeah and then you know we did a music visit together in new york we filmed like you know the video for it and uh for some reason nina and i got really along very well and then i went on tour with her and then she 
oh, we wanted to put a band together in Los Angeles later on in the 90s and, you know, mid to late 90s, but it was like a little bit of a mess <clears throat> that never kind of, you know, came through. She's an interesting character. I say it in a good way. She's, uh, you know, it's, uh, but it's also pretty interesting to work with her <laughs> and finding out and make schedules work and all these things, you know. But hey, that's cool. There's nothing wrong sometimes of uh, being eccentric. Now, um, in what ways was she is eccentric? How could you define that with Nina Hagen? It was just, just the way she dresses, the way she kind of, you know, projects herself and just like very, you know, a quirky person, you know, more like that, you know, and, and she's, she's really cool. She's a really great person. Uh, I wish her always all the best, you know, she's, uh, yeah, she's doing well, I hope. You know, I haven't kind of heard from her in a while, but uh, we might reconnect and at some point do something again together. You never know, right? Was that the Revolution Ballroom tour? That must have been on that. That was exactly the tour that I did. That's unbelievable. Did you know that? That's so cool, man. I really enjoyed uh, some of her earlier work. There was like an, uh, an album called Non Sex Monk Rock. Yeah. That was a brilliant album, I thought. Very underrated. And I remember like the, the record company, they didn't like it at all. You know, and the management, we, 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 you know, I had talk with them and they said like the, the record company was like, oh my God, what are we going to do with that? Because it was like so out and weird. But I thought in a good way. It was like really, really cool. And uh, we wanted to play something of that. I guess we we ended up not doing that. We played like old Nina Hagen band stuff, you know, like Wow Wow, this one song, then punk, you know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, TV Glotzer, which is uh, white, white punk some dope from the tubes, you know, that kind of stuff. So we did these things. It was fun, you know, because that's like, those albums came out when I was like, what, seven, eight years old, you know, and all of a sudden I was playing with her on stage in my early 20s. I thought like, this is so cool, you know, yeah. And um, Paul, actually, Paul Rossler plays keyboards. Uh, He's from the Screamers, a, a, a legendary L.A. punk band. Yes. He plays keyboards on that Nuno Monk sex rock album. Yes, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I don't know, really. I know that there's a Chris Bedding is on the album. Uh -huh. Yeah, and Ellen Schwarzberg uh, played drums. Quirky album, I love it. Yeah. Anti, Anti World, wow, what a cool song. During that tour, did you meet Phil Manzanera or Andy McKay? Uh, no, I did not because I know he produced uh, uh, Revolution Ballroom. But I met Phil Manzanera recently when I was touring with Stephen Wilson and mm -hmm. David Gilmore came to our show with Phil Manzanera. So they hung out, so lovely guy, both of them. <laughs> What is it like for you to, to meet somebody like a David Gilmore or a Phil Manzanera? Well, I have a very good David Gilmore story. So the thing was like, they wouldn't let him in um, because he tried to sneak to the back door. And it was like, not even, it was not really a great area. It was like, you know, in some shady part, like somewhere, you know, in the backwoods of London, some industrial area or whatever it was, you know. And, uh, and he just decided before the show alone to walk in the shady alley, uh, the, the, uh, through the shady alleyway and amongst dumpsters and whatnot, and all of a sudden there he was at the door. And uh, fortunately I kept my backstage door open. I all of a sudden heard like this racket going on between our security guy and some other guy. And I just heard like this big bald guy, you know, like going like, sorry, sorry, you can't come in, blah, 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 you don't have a backstage pass. And then I heard the other guy going like, no, 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 they're expecting me, you know, I just wanted to show up and say hi before the show. And he goes like, ah, sorry, you can't do that, you know, I gotta get your pass and you know, by the ticket booth and blah, blah, walk around. But, but no, 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 look, don't want any trouble, they're, they're expecting me, I'm David Gilmore. And I was like, <gasps> put my sticks down, boom, and just, you know, ran out and I just looked at them and go like, He's all right. And he goes like, oh, oh, okay. And then Dave was like, oh, there you go. So and I was, <laughs> it was like one of the most awkward, but also beautiful moments. So there I was like 10 minutes alone with David Gilmore, getting him a pass and we hung. And what do you say, right? That's one of those things, you know, you just go like, you know, you just go like, hey, you know, um, I'm, you know, Wish You Were Here was a great album, isn't it? I'm sure you haven't heard that before. You know, you don't say that. You just kind of talk about other things. What are you doing? Hey, what are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing a new album. Oh, so do I. Awesome. It was actually really, really endearing. Yeah. <laughs> did, 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 that was definitely him being held outside by the security guard is definitely an us and them nice minute. One. Absolutely. No, it was more the wall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, man. You're good. You nailed it. That was the wall. How did your solo drum performance at the Modern Drummer Fest change your life? I kind of completely remembered doors opened like crazy. 
And it was kind of interesting because I played like a bunch of festivals and with band and with bands around the world and all this kind of stuff, you know. But all of a sudden, Modern Drama Fest in the late 90s, that was still a big deal. You know, that was like, you know, what the guitar players had in the 80s, this huge, you know, guitar shredder kind of thing or guitar world stuff that happened to us drummers in the 90s. And I was right there at the right moment, at the right time, I guess, you know, where those doors opened. And I was not even thinking about it, you know, I was just doing my, my thing and I kind of worked hard on, you know, my technique and my abilities to articulate myself on my instrument. And then I thought like, hmm, let's see if it finds response, how the people will like it. And I never forget how, how big of an uproar this whole thing was. I started playing and then, and people loved it. And, uh, And I think you know, one, one guy said, like, hey, you didn't even realize, but you got three standing ovations in, like, in between songs and then after, and was like, oh, shit. I was like, really? And I remember like, finishing the show, and I thought, I, I was completely conscious that like, something complete, completely clicked here, something completely turned around. Like, there's like a, a whole other door that opened, and it did from that moment on. It was kind of strange you know, to, to have this sort of epiphany or this you know, sort of you know, experience that kind of gives you this this feeling that something big is going to happen or that that you're on a different level now how did you get the call from adrian blue to join the adrian blue trio with julie slick that is like such an interesting question because i seriously don't remember that anymore it's what strange, right? what was the high what were the highlights of that and what did you learn from him oh you know i was always a huge king crimson fan you know and i loved what he did actually in frank zappa's band and with david bowie and uh And he was just like such a chill guy, or is, you know, we just bumped into each other recently again on the cruise to the edge. And he is just like, you know, really very, very funny kind of guy, funny hang, you know, has good sounds always, has always fun on stage, is always smiling, always in good spirits. And, uh, and we were a trio, like what we did, with, what we're doing with the aristocrats, you know, so it's a very tight and very intimate traveling experience and also on the stage, you know, we have like a lot of freedom and can kind of, you know, adjust to each other very well. I love that, you know, so that was, that was what I kind of took away from it, you know. Yeah, definitely great. You know? What makes Julie Slick a great bass player? Uh, her sounds and her personality and her groove and kind of listening, having big ears. That's the thing. We really locked very well, you know, knowing when to play more and knowing when to leave things out. That's kind of, you know, always pretty much, you know, the, uh, I would say, like the equation that it has to come to. You played on the Nana featuring Nana album, which was her 2001 comeback record. Yeah. That's your second iconic German female musician that you played with sure. how satisfying is that to you um so and so because uh, working with her was not always easy and uh, and we did like a pretty intense tour as well you know it, it was a long tour you know played in front of many audience many many people and the album itself was pretty good it went double platinum and uh, We rearranged like 99 Red Balloons and, and Leuchtturm, which is Lighthouse and all those big songs. And it sold, it sold very, very, very well. And again, like the touring part, yeah, it was okay. Sometimes a little bit difficult to deal with, you know. It's like one of those things when you sometimes go off a tour and you think like, you know what, am I gonna do this again? I don't know. <laughs> How did you get the call from Eddie Jobson to form what would become UKZ? Yeah, exactly. UKZ, that was a thing. Um, he called me, like, he wrote me an email all of a sudden out of the blue. I think he researched musicians and found me somewhere on YouTube or, I don't know, maybe a friend you know, told him about me. And, uh... And I always loved his work, you know, from, you know, Zinc, his album was really cool, and uh, some of the UK stuff, and then when he played with Jethro Tull, and then when he played actually also with Frank Zappa and those guys, and then Roxy Music, and that was actually very, very satisfying, you know, like just to kind of, you know, build this whole thing, you know, from scratch, and then kind of, you know, doing those tours, where also like John Wetton was part of, and then Billy Sheehan, and, uh, and all those guys. And so we had actually quite a few good years together, you know, gotta say, reviving all those songs and then writing some new songs with it. I thought it made some impact, you know? Tell me about your first, the first time you met John Wetton and, and how you guys bonded. John became a really, really dear friend of uh, me and my family. And uh, it is an absolute shame, you know, that he passed away. And I was on the road when he passed away with uh, Joe Cetriani and I got invited to the funeral and uh, by his family and uh, I couldn't make it. And what was even more heartbreaking than they kind of, you know, sent me 
later on how it went and what songs they played and you know the whole order and john and i had a really you know personal and cool relationship we would talk about anything about like family about like problems in life about marriage and all kinds of stuff so it came as a little bit of a shock you know or unexpected that you all of a sudden got very ill you know yeah and what was your experience like during uh the time that you were in uk with john um you know john and eddie had like a little bit of a love-hate relationship sometimes so you know they would sometimes poke at each other but respect each other at the same time and but the experience was wonderful you know eddie's like well high strung you know and john was always more mellow right you know so at the end of the day we were all going happily off stage kind of you know having performed great songs like carry no cross or something like that it was that was always cool you know very appreciated that moment yeah and how did you feel about uh, taking on Bill Bruford's parts and taking on Terry Bozio's parts? That was very cool because you know, growing up, you know, listening to those drummers and these drummers are very different. You know, Bill, you know, from Terry, completely different style. And uh, I had the freedom, I was given the freedom to interpret exactly the parts, you know, the way I wanted to. There were like obviously certain fills like in Danger Money or something that have to be like that or Presto Vivace or something like that. But um, in general, I had a lot of freedom and I guess, you know, that's, that makes a great musician or, or a good composer when they just don't have you in the band to kind of just mimic parts but to make them your own and that was the cool thing to hear like uk you know with the version that i wanted to see it you know that was actually very very cool you know did you compose with john wetton ever no we didn't we kind of improvised a few things and uh but we never kind of on stage that was more like uk material you know no with john not you know with eddie we kind of you know did this thing for ukz yeah, yeah how did you come to have a relationship with legendary rush guitarist alex lifeson that was that started actually way back also through uk and uh eddie contacted him and also neil peart we wanted to do a double drum thing together and they both got back and it was actually quite quite beautiful you know and alex uh, wrote a really nice email but they were just going out on the tour and Neil said, like, well, you know, that would take a lot of time to learn those parts and stuff. And, and they actually both refused to work with UK then by the time, but in a really, really, really nice way. But since then, actually, Alex and I always like, kind of crossed paths, like either, either way, like, you know, through Stephen Wilson or through my former record company. And so he got invited to play on my album Borrego the first time. So I did like four or five songs that he's on with him and now actually we just wrote an album together which i think is came out really 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 uh, well actually is an eight minute kind of song which is called lovers calling mohini days on bass and alex kind of did the whole guitar arrangement for it and brought in his whole entourage like richard chicky who mixed actually the album and then also all the song and then also andy vendette who mastered it and he's also on my new record. The song is actually also available in digital form on my new album, which is called My Sister. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great relationship with this guy. You know, he's like really, really cool. And I learned actually a lot through working with him to take more time with things because I'm very fast, you know, with composing. And sometimes I have a little more of this attitude going like, cool, once the song is done, let's release it. And then let's do the next album. And Alex went, always forth and back and then again you know it's like ah i'm not happy with the guitars let, let me try this approach let me try that approach hmm maybe i kind of you know do an, an overdub maybe i kind of incorporate some electric guitars over here but maybe like a weird kind of acoustic guitar over there and here's this guitar backwards twice so we can kind of do something with it and i go like you know what that's actually kind of cool and i thought like while we were doing this song i was parallel actually working on other songs as well because i knew he would come back with something but then all of a sudden after a few weeks you know that thing was done or actually a few months but he was very picky about it and i liked it and he goes like hey we have like the singer i like to incorporate maya win she has this great voice and and, and was like well how about mohini on bass then and it was just beautiful and i decided you know to take my time with this album then as well i go like you know what i kind of you know uh, take this as an example to kind of you know the songs that i really like on the album kind of revisit make sure that the vocals are 100% all right, you know, that the playing is 100% all right, that the sound is really good, and maybe let it sit there for two months and then revisit it, you know, that kind of shit, to see, like, if I'm still happy with this. And uh, I think it became one of my best albums, you know, if I don't want to sound self-indulgent, but I think it's very important. So, uh, and I have to thank Alex for that a little bit, you know, to kind of open my eyes for that a little bit, to take your time with things. 
He also plays on your supergroup, The Mute God's new song, One Day, off the album, Atheists and Believers. With Nick Beggs, yeah. uh, ex Kaja Gugu. That was the thing. I brought him into this production because there was this one song we have, which is called One Day. And it's a really cool riff. And I just heard Alex over it. I just heard him in my, inside my head. I thought, like, he would fit perfectly. And Alex is very selective. He kind of, you know, if he doesn't like something, he doesn't do it. But if he... If he likes it, he's completely into the zone. Like completely, he goes fully into details. And with one day, it was like one of those things. You know, he kind of you know completely uh, uh, played like multiple acoustic guitars and whatnot. It's just ultimate joy. It was like great. And I guess it really makes also a great musician. First of all, to yeah, dedicate yourself to what you love and make no compromises. Would you uh, join a band with Geddy Lee and Alex Lifeson? Hell yes, absolutely. There's nothing wrong with those guys. <laughs> Tell me about how you get past being that kid that used to listen to Rush albums and then actually creating music and art with this man, Alex Lifeson. It's an interesting uh, topic, you know, because obviously, well, you learn to kind of move swiftly from the idolizing factor because you know since you were a kid you were listening you know to rush or something to having a personal relationship and um it kind of it, it's still <laughs> at first it was obviously intimidating you go like oh my god the guitar tracks come in right you know go like oh, let's see what we do with these right you know and then you incorporate them and you kind of touch them with like you know silk gloves you know to kind of you you, you kind of you're really careful with this and you think like oh my god here's a piece of art coming in but it, then after a while you just learn like yeah it is a piece of art but also we have to collaborate and still kind of form the car and the vehicle that it's drivable right you know so let's do the best let's make the best out of it and um so it became you know from i mean both kind of an idealizing to a, like a really kind of uh, a cool collaborating relationship you did a project with tony levin and jordan rudis did that live up to the original musical concept that you guys had when you sat down and thought it up i thought it came out actually even better i was very proud of these productions both albums came out really 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 well and uh We'd never actually even been together with that trio in a studio. We worked remotely and it, a little bit like with the aristocrats, you know, we wrote our songs separately and then, you know, sent them around and then added things until we were happy. The only things that were kind of sometimes a, a discussion or kind of, you know, work, what we worked on were sounds or something like that. When Jordan brought like MIDI keyboards in or certain kind of saxophone sounds and I thought like, mm, I like the acoustic piano better, these things sometimes, right? But overall, it was like a very respectful collaboration. Every, th every song came out beautifully, ultimate freedom. And uh, so what we did, kind of, we sent it to like one big hub. You know, we kind of basically wrote everything together and sent it to one guy to mix it. You know, and that was kind of cool because you know then you have like you know sort of yeah a little bit like a like a, like a hub you know like somebody you know, like a station you know where where you can kind of you know write to and then fix little things you know if needed. But you know the three of us you know we had to kind of you know basically cohesive and also like an agreement. What did you love about that project? Um, it was actually very very fast and reliable everybody actually worked without any sort of kind of you know scheduling conflict by that time so when we agreed on doing these albums you know the songs came out pretty fast and were also kind of you know worked on or kind of you know collected very fast and also kind of uh, produced in this way you know that it came out beautifully without actually any compromise how was a true collaboration obtained with Terry Bozio, Chad Wackerman on the Trio Drummer Tour of 2006? The BMW to, uh, Tour, the Bozio, Miniman, Wackerman Tour. Um, we had to set up actually in a very interesting way because Terry is 10 years older than Chad and Chad is 10 years older than I am. So we all came from different generations. So Chad never grew up with a click track. So his time would kind of move a little bit and he announced it or he goes like, look, you guys have great timing there because you were in the 80s and 90s. Everybody was already kind of rock solid. And he goes like, catch me if I fall. You know, that was literally his kind of thing. If I kind of do this, either way, join me or it was cool, you know, in, in that way. So Chad and I would kind of, you know, face each other and Terry would be here, you know. So we would kind of, you know, all of us always kind of have the chance to have ultimate communication and also visually, you know, uh, connect being connected. When you walk away from a situation like that where you're playing with other masters, does, it, does some of that uh, rub off on you? Absolutely. You always learn. You never stop improving. 
I always say that, like, leave yourself headroom. Like, never be fully happy. I mean, it's good to be happy, but one out of ten gigs is maybe when we go off stage and go like, hey, that was awesome. You know, but usually, even if people go like, hey, that was the best show we ever seen in your life, I would go like, nah, it really wasn't. You know, you can improve. How does your drumming personality differ from working with Joe Satriani to Paul Gilbert to Adrian Ballou to Alex Lifeson? How do you know who the real Marco Miniman is? Well, it should be always me, I guess, you know, that I know that I am myself is when the composers I work with uh, or the people let me just do my own thing and give me free hand. Um, the worst thing that can happen is like if somebody tells you exactly as drums are programmed. That's when you know your personality suffers from that. But all, you know, the other, all the guitar players you mentioned hired me for who I am and not for who they want me to be. Yeah. Do you ever hear yourself repeating yourself? musically i never repeat myself only if i repeat myself i repeat myself <laughs> your friend mike keneally asked you to play drums on his collaboration with former xtc vocalist andy partridge for the album Wingbeak fantastic what was that like for you awesome it was really fun there was it was Wingbeak fantastic yeah. and uh, because it was like andy partridge's kind of comeback after xtc and uh it, I, I felt honored you know because i was a huge fan since i was a kid you know of that band and all of a sudden having the chance to kind of you know collaborate with that with him you know and uh that was that was a, that was a big deal and he was very 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 nice he was like oh god bless thank you so much you know <laughs> that kind of dude it's really cool yeah if you could collaborate with any musician, rock star, legend, living or dead, who would it be? Freddie Mercury. How do you think the Aristocrats 2019 album, You Know What, and tour is a progression from 2011's The Aristocrats, 2013's Culture Clash, and 2015's Trace Caballeros? Well, you know, in the first album, we had to find ourselves. It was like basically, you know, three you know individuals being thrown into one studio we had chemistry but then we kind of you know created just as the first album fast and furious basically like you know we literally did it in nine days and uh that was a thing but it was raw you know and then we toured we got to know each other better so on culture clash what we did was like we already you know knew how to write for each other a little bit like you know with our you know personalities in mind and then on tres caballeros what we did we tried out to kind of play the songs in the live setting before we went into the studio to kind of gel more nicely. And with You Know What, yeah, that was basically You Know What. You know, we didn't, we didn't give a fuck anymore. It was like we knew exactly what we liked, how we play, what we wanted. We booked actually extensive studio time and we were not shying away from uh, overdubbing and kind of uh, trying to kind of write songs that would bring us into a trio format, you know, that we have to kind of represent life in that way. So we were just kind of taking ultimate liberty and freedom. And I think it became our finest work so far. The Blaring Out Show.